هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله بلاهي الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين In the name of God, the most mighty, the most holy, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Well, <clears throat> here I am. I've been a Muslim for eight months. If I could tell you all of the ways that my life has changed, we'd be here another eight months. This is the most remarkable period of a life that, subhanAllah, it has already been well, I think it's remarkable. I've had a good life so far, but nothing compares to the luck, the pleasure, the honor of being chosen to be a Muslim. And I'm immensely grateful every single day for the journey that has brought me here to you today, standing here in the hijab. Imagine that. Sometimes, you know, I have an out-of-body experience and I see myself standing in a doorway when I'm speaking to the Muslim community and I see myself a year ago going, you're kidding me, right? Hijab? What happened? So if you don't mind, tonight I'm going to take you on a journey from a life without faith to a life with the faith. When I was growing up, in the 70s in London. My father was a Catholic who had lost his faith. He had been beaten by nuns at a convent school and had belief in God pretty much beaten out of him by the time he was 12 years old. That didn't stop him singing Protestant songs after a few beers, which confused our Jewish neighbors very much. My mother, I suppose you'd call her a superstitious Christian. We would never go to church, but I remember she had lots of big crucifixes that she would hang around the house to keep away evil spirits. So into this household was born a little girl whose name was actually Sarah. Isn't that interesting? I've taken that name back, by the way. So if you want to call me Sarah, you're welcome. And I remember, as a child, always believing in God. It was natural. There was mum and dad, there was nan and granddad, and there was God. I never remember a time when there wasn't God. Well, I remember a time when my arrogance put him in a corner of the universe and I ignored him. I'm very lucky that he chose not to punish me yet for that and that I got this chance. So I remember as a child saying prayers that began, like all children do, Dear God, please take my sister away just for a couple of weeks, she's really annoying. Dear God, please make mummy and daddy nicer to me. But I remember having this sense of awe. And I remember never quite understanding why people spoke about Jesus in the same breath as God. That never really made any sense to me as a child. So we didn't have much religion in our household in the 70s, but, but my father did give me some ethics. And ethics, giving children a sense of values, this can set them on the right path. This can point them in the right direction. You might be surprised to know that we were very poor when I was growing up. My father was an actor, but he hadn't worked for 10 years when I came along. And I remember one day when I was 10 years old, going to him in a real anger and saying, I'm sick of being poor, I hate being poor, it's embarrassing. He looked at me and he said, what do you mean we're poor? And I said, look, we don't have any toilet paper. Instead of toilet paper, we use the newspaper. This means we're poor. And my father looked at me and he said, what newspaper do we use? I didn't understand. What do you mean, what newspaper? 
what's the name of the newspaper that we use? I said, well, when we go to the bathroom, we use the Guardian newspaper. And he said, well, that's the newspaper of aspiration. If we were poor, we'd be using the Daily Mail. He gave me a, a sense that there was a difference between having hope in your life and being hopeless, and that education was a way out of poverty. And it shaped my early view of the world. But it was very difficult staying spiritual in secular Britain in the 70s and 80s. Even when we did go to church, it was very much as if God was a rather sad figure who'd once done something great by creating the universe and had then really not known what to do with himself ever since. And had been waiting for Sunday for a few people to throw a few pennies in the form of prayers up to heaven. It was a pretty pitiful state. And it didn't make you feel that sense of awe that I had as a child. It didn't raise your spirit up at all. And then of course come the teenage years. Hormones, alcohol, yes, some drugs. And I forgot all about the meaning of life. I forgot to ask myself why why am I here? Why are any of us here? What are we doing? Is there a next life? I thought that I was making things happen in the universe. I was, alhamdulillah, not bad looking. I went to drama school. I thought I was better looking than I was, to be quite honest. Looking back, never mind. And I got into the cult of me. If I had a success, if I got a job, it was because I was clever and smart and funny and better educated than the other person. I got into a competitive nature. I would probably walk over someone to get the job. It was never quite like that. But I'll tell you, being at acting school, it tries to make you like that. You've got to be prettier, you've got to be smarter, you've got to be mouthier. If you want a door open, kick it down. Isn't that the, the ethics? of the society we live in now, and it certainly was in 80s Britain. So what were my perceptions of Islam when I was growing up? Well, I didn't know much about it. I thought it was a Pakistani religion, for a start. I had no idea there were Arab Muslims. Not a clue. There were three Muslim girls at my school, and from watching them over six or seven years, I drew three conclusions about Islam. One, the girls always had long hair. Two, the girls were always really, really good at maths and science. And three, Muslim girls never dated boys. That was it. There was no threat. There was no fear. There was no great Osama bin Laden bogey man waiting around the corner to come and get us. There were just quiet girls with long hair being good at maths. Frankly, I don't know what happened. So as time went on, I began to look around. I looked around at the world, and there are certain moments in your life when an image comes to you. For people who were around in the 70s, you might remember one such image. It's of a young girl in Cambodia running away from a burning village. And this little girl, she has napalm on her back and she's screaming, American napalm, on this little girl's back. And it sticks in your mind. Well, in the year 2000, another image came on my television screen and I just could not shake it. It was the image of Faris O'Day. Has anybody here heard of Faris O'Day? Faris O'Day should quite frankly be as famous as Anne Frank for his sacrifice. Faris O'Day was a 15 year old boy from uh, Gaza, from Rafa. And he used to throw stones at tanks. And in November 2000, he had a stone in his hand and a tank was bearing down on him. 
and he's such a figure of power and strength and determination. And the back of this boy's body, this young boy's body is saying, you will not come to my refugee camp today. Oh no, you will not come and frighten my sisters and my mother. Nine days after that photo was taken, he was shot in the neck by an Israeli sniper and killed. Nobody remembers the name of Faris Oday, but it did something to me. I was a journalist at the time, working for the mainstream media, writing about politics sometimes, but also about living in France and buying and selling property and hair colour and I don't know, all sorts of nonsense. But that I knew that, what, that I had to go to Palestine because the, the words didn't match the image. The BBC seemed to be saying, look at that nice Israeli tank bearing down on that horrid, Arab, dangerous Muslim urchin that seemed to be congratulating the tank for attacking the child. And as a journalist, I couldn't understand how this was happening. Was it because the boy was Palestinian? Was it because he was Arab? Was it because he was Muslim? Maybe it was all three. In 2005, I managed to get a commission to go to Palestine. And I know you think this might be a bit of a lecture on Palestine instead of Islam, but I promise to get there. It's just that it's so significant to, to everything that I feel and breathe really now. And to every reason that I became a Muslim it begins with Palestine. In 2005, I crossed my first checkpoint to Ramallah. And it was only when I got there that I realized that I was afraid. I was actually afraid of Palestinians. A part of me had soaked in the idea that they wanted to kill white people. I found myself then, on my second day ever in the Middle East, in occupied Palestine, in a lift with the guards of Mahmoud Abbas who were taking me to interview him. Six foot men, guns, leather jacket, speaking Arabic. I was standing there and I heard one of them say something like, Bukra, Bukra, Yalla, Yalla, Inshallah. And in my mind, the subtitle said, we'll kill the white woman later. I couldn't help it. That's what I heard. Every Arabic voice seemed to be waiting to behead me, seemed to be dangerous. How long would it take me to reprogram myself? I'll tell you how long it took. About 48 hours in Palestine. So incredible are the people there. So generous, so kind. I didn't even know it got cold in Palestine, so I was walking along the streets on the second day, having had uh, my interview with Mahmoud Abbas, and an old lady came over to me and she grabbed me and she took me to her house, and she didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Arabic, and she just looked at me. I was sopping wet. The Israelis had taken my clothes and I didn't have a coat. And she took me to a wardrobe and she took a suitcase out and she packed all of the clothes into a suitcase, and she put a coat on my back and she wrote down her name as an address, gave me a kiss on both cheeks and said, Yalla. I thought, what is this? What is this? This woman doesn't know me. I thought of Faris Oday. I thought of these scary people. I wanted to cry. It was the first time of a thousand times that I would cry in Palestine. And it was a realization that there's a generosity in the people there. I'm, I want to raise something with you. I want you to think about this. Whenever people, whenever Westerners, you know, I don't like that phrase, whenever journalists go to Palestine or to anywhere in the Middle East, they say, ah, oh, the Arab generosity. God, fantastic, the Arabs, you know. Very generous. I've never ever heard a fellow journalist say, blimey, those Muslims, Tell you, that makes them, it's generosity. It's Islam that makes them generous, you know. No, it's something, it's some gene in the Arab character that makes them generous. Nothing whatsoever to do with Islam. But every time something goes wrong, then it's Islam. In 2007, I went to Lebanon. 
I was taken there, I was invited by um, a political group whose name begins with H. I won't say the name of the group because I'll get you all into trouble because this is the land of the free and the brave and you can't say that here, can you? So this group, beginning with H, who are a legal political party, but who I'm not allowed to say because this is the land of the free, said, come along and just see the damage that's been done to us and please write an article. So when I landed at Beirut airport, I was still not really... I hadn't met many Muslim women in the hijab. I'd been working in Palestine, sure, but I'd met the brothers. I'd met politicians. Uh, I'd met one or two women, of course, in the workplace, but I hadn't spent enough time in the homes to see what and who hijabi women were. To me, maybe they were still kept to one side in a brutal way. So when I was met at Beirut airport by three feisty young hijabi sisters, I was surprised. The first one came up to me, her name was Zainab, and said, Hi, I'm Zainab. I'm with the party beginning with H. I'm the media representative. How are you? I said, what? How can you be with the party beginning with H? It's run by men in turbans. I've seen it on TV. She said, oh, believe me, the men think they run it. <laughs> that was a surprise. What's going on here? I spent two weeks with these sisters. They were incredible. And by the end of the two weeks, I realized something. I had hijab envy. I had hijab envy. I was with my blonde hair out, feeling it was so important to be looked at, to be visually poured, if you like, by every man that I saw. And these women were in the top of their engineering class, top of their political game, being treated with respect, telling it like it was, sassy, doing what they wanted but in an Islamic way, and treated nicely by men. I wanted that. But still I was suspicious, still I thought, okay, come on, don't be naive. You know, you're turning into an Arabophile, fine. Keep, keep it in context. Probably when they go home they're beaten or terrible things happen to them. Just keep it in context. Context. So I remember we drove down to the south of uh, Lebanon and we were there to meet a sheikh called Sheikh Nabil Kawak. He's number two or three in the party beginning with H, which I can't say because we're in the land of the free. And he was talking uh, about a prisoner swap to me in very uh, rapid Arabic. And at one point, Zainab, who was translating, put her hand up and went, whoa, hang on a second, shape. And I thought, she stopped him with her hand. She stopped the shape who delivered the victory over Israel with her hand. And I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, but I have to be honest. I have to be honest, the thought came into my mind, here comes the bullwhip. I thought she'd be taken outside, I thought she'd be beaten, I thought, you know, that some tension would rise in the room. Let me tell you exactly what happened. The shade looked at her and said, carry on, sister. That was it. That was it. Something just fell away. I realized for the first time in my life that just because I watched the news and read the Daily Mail, I was not an expert on Islam. There were things I actually didn't know. I became more curious. But I still wouldn't have thought that I was on the road to becoming a Muslim myself. Oh, no, 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 no. That was never going to happen to me. <laughs> I had a plan. I just didn't know that Allah had a plan. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best plan. I didn't know this. Alhamdulillah, in 2008, I went back to uh, Gaza on a mission that I don't think any of you will have heard of, but it was actually historic. 46 people from around the world got into two ancient fishing vessels and sailed from Cyprus to Gaza. The Free Gaza was the first boat to dock at a Palestinian shore in 41 years. Alhamdulillah, I was one of those 46 people on the boat. And when we got there, there were around 50,000 Palestinians cheering, crying, kids climbing up onto the boats. It was incredible. I didn't want to leave. And there I was, 
in what Melanie Phillips, a really obnoxious right-wing writer, calls Hamas Stan, the center of the Hamas world, the Hamas, as they say in Israel, the Hamas. I spent a month there. I had such fun. How can you have fun in Gaza? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I don't know. I, it, every night in Gaza you cry yourself to sleep and every morning you wake up and you're glad you're in Gaza with the people. That's the only way I can describe it to you. I had a driver who was my Hamas bodyguard who had called himself Mr. Falafel. He was living the dream as much as you can. He had a gun on his hip, a free car from Hamas, and for a while he had a blonde on his, uh, in his uh, passenger seat. Everyone was going, way! And they were so friendly. Why am I saying the blonde thing? Why am I saying that? Because nobody told me what to do. They welcomed me like a sister because they knew I'd risked for them. And they said, the young men of Hamas and other groups, if you come here in peace, we will show you peace because Islam is peace. We don't want to hurt the Jews. We don't want to fight the Christians. We don't want to fight anybody, but we want our land. And I started to understand. And I stopped seeing Islam as a violent, reactionary, invented religion. And I started to feel love for the people who practice Islam. One specific moment happened, perhaps my first really significant moment. In August 2008, Ramadan, you know what a magical month that is. How many converts have I met in the last eight months? When did you convert to Ramadan? What was the first time that you felt Islam in your heart, Ramadan? For me too. I was visiting a refugee camp in Rafa, a terrible cement block home where a mother was supporting 16 children in two rooms. If you can picture mattresses around the room, the walls, dirty mattresses, old mattresses, a cement floor, nothing to eat. And this woman opened the door to me like this. Assalamu alaikum. Fadal. Fadal. And she greeted me as if I was going into the Taj Mahal. And I thought, this is amazing. This woman was so vibrant, so full of joy, and her life was one, none, to me, never-ending misery. How could it be that she could greet me as if I was going into the Taj Mahal? How could she have that shine in her eyes? I still have the picture. It chokes me whenever I see it. And I was angry. I was angry. I was sick and tired of Ramadan for the people there. Sick and tired of it. So I said to the sister, sister, tell me something. Why did your God starve you during Ramadan? If your God loves you, tell me. Why does he deny you water when life in Gaza is already hard enough? Please, sister, would you respect and out of love for the Palestinians that I've met, tell me how your God loves you and what lesson you have from Ramadan because I'm not getting it. Why do you fast in Ramadan? She looked straight into my eyes and she said, Sister, we fast in Ramadan to remember the poor. I'll never forget that moment. It was like a, a key went into the lock of my heart and a thought came into my mind and it was this. If this is Islam, I'm in. If this is Islam, I want this. But I still wasn't ready, so I pushed it away and I carried on with my life. But things seemed to be happening around me. I couldn't ever quite forget about Islam. For example, every time I got into a taxi cab in North London, the Eritrean and Somali taxi drivers would give me dawah. I'm telling you they're lethal. There is a silent revolution happening, and it's all from Africa, and it's the brothers working double shifts, day and night, and they get in their cab and they, Salam alaikum. How are you? I'm feeling a bit low. Well, you know the Prophet, Salam alaikum. Uh, he would have said this. Really? Wow, he sounds like a nice guy, amazing guy. Salam alaikum. 
They're least, but I'm telling you. And I used to talk to them, and I used to take the lessons away, and it always warmed my heart. In 2009, my husband had a, my husband at the time had a motorbike accident in the middle of the night. I was at home with my two children and a policeman knocked on the door, two policemen knocked on the door and they brought me a bag of clothes and said, your husband was found on the road, he's in a coma, we think he won't make it through the night. And I didn't know what to do. So I threw myself on the ground and I put my head to the ground and I said, Allah, that's the only name I wanted. I didn't call my mum, I didn't call my sister, I only called his mum so I could tell her, I only called Allah. Please help him, don't let him die like this, I'll have children, please, please, Allah. It was a miracle he didn't die. He pretty much recovered in 12 weeks. Miraculous time, the doctor said. At one point, he saw a specialist having been two weeks in a coma, three months learning to eat again. He walked into his office. The specialist said, ah, you should be in bed. You shouldn't even be walking. But I still wasn't with them. That happened last October the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle. You know, for some people who revert to Islam, the path is an academic one. They read the Quran, they see the sense, they research, they understand the words, and they come to Islam through that. That's why the Quran is a magic book. For me, I'm a heart and soul type person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows us all because he made us. So I went to Iran last October just to work. I was reporting on the Al Quds Day rally. And please, if anybody here is shifting in their seat, seat at the word Iran, please don't. There are Muslims in Iran. And as a foreigner going to Iran, all I heard was Allah Hu Akbar. And they seem to be Muslims to me. And the mosques seem to be mosques to me. I had one day off and a sister said to me, come to Qom, it's a very holy city, come and see how the Muslims love their faith in Iran. Come and spend the evening, we'll have, um, it was Ramadan again, look at that, guess what, it was Ramadan. Wouldn't you know it. So I did wudu with thousands of other pilgrims, went inside this amazing mosque, and I said a little prayer, I said, dear Allah, Thank you so much for this journey I'm on. Thank you. Just thank you. I don't need anything from you because I have so much. Please just look after Palestine tonight. That's all I ask. Just please look after the people of Palestine. And then I sat down in the mosque. And at that moment, something incredible happened. It was as if everything, every pain I'd ever known went. It was as if every worry I had was gone. It was as if I touched a part of the universe where everything is silence and happiness and calm and everything's okay. Above our worries, above our little trivial woes, do you know what? Everything is okay. Everything in the universe. It's beautiful. I didn't know what was going on. I just sat there for... I don't know, an hour maybe? And then a sister came up to me and she put her hands on my shoulders. And for no reason I could fathom, she looked into my eyes and she said, I love you. I'd never seen her before. I've never seen her since. And I told her I loved her. And at that moment I realized that I was no longer a visitor to a Muslim country, I was no longer a, a, a tourist to Islamic nations, that I was inside the Ummah. I slept the night on the shrine, in the shrine, on the floor. I didn't want to leave. I prayed Fajr in the morning, and the feeling was still there, this lightness. And then I went outside the mosque, and I said to myself, Oh no, not Islam, please. 
because I knew what was happening. I knew it. And I was really scared. And my conscious mind was going, oh, come on, really? You, a Muslim? No way. No way. You can't do this. You can't give up drinking. You can't be a good person like you need to be. You don't even know. You haven't even read the Quran. Don't be stupid. But another voice said to me very calmly, this is the best feeling you've ever had. Go with it. See what happens. You don't have to do anything. I resisted for seven more days until I got back to London and then I said my shahada. And alhamdulillah, I've now been a Muslim for eight months. Eight of the happiest months of my life. Allah. SubhanAllah. I just want to end by telling you how my children took the news. My children are eight and ten years old, two girls, and they only had three questions when I said I was going to be a Muslim. And they said, question number one, when you're a Muslim, will you still be mummy? I said, yes, when I'm a Muslim, I will probably be a better mummy. Okay, question number two was, when you're a Muslim, will you drink alcohol? And I said, promise you, when I'm a Muslim, I will never touch alcohol again. To which the, my daughter said, hooray, rather worrying. And the final question was, when you're a Muslim, will you wear low-cut tops? I thought, what have they been hearing about Islam? I said, no, when you're a Muslim, you cover up everything. And my daughter said without any prompting, we love Islam. <laughs> and now they pray once a day. They both know Al-Fatiha and Alhamdulillah. I call them my little Ayatollahs because they boss me around. The other day, well, anyway, they boss me around. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening. And all praise to Allah and all mistakes are my own. Allah Allah